we're racing against time, we're racing against ourselves, keep the cup side up and the downside down. It is a tremendous test of sailors. And the reason why it's so attractive is because it is tough. If it was easy, no one would have anything to boast about afterwards, would they? We're going so fast, we're at the top of Scotland already, only 140 miles from Mucka Flugger, and uh, we're really only just... It's just relentless, the water coming over the deck. And, uh, and even down below, the boat's really wet as well, so it's just, there's no escape. Everything's wet. This is the Weekly Sailing Highlights Show, World on Water, August 5, 2022. These are the highlights of the most important sailing events, released last week. Emirates Team New Zealand are busy with their land yacht project. This video is about the pod. It can be loaded with weight, as needed, and gives Horonuku the writing moment it needs to generate thrust, and it's Glenn's job to fly it just so for optimum speed. The pod is like our keel on a yacht. It's a pile of mass out on a long lever arm that creates, we call it the riding moment in the sailing industry. So we can vary the amount of lead in that pod anywhere from sort of 300 kilos up to about 1.1 tonnes. But what that does is it lets you basically load up the wing which is trying to tip the craft over so you're counteracting that. But the more you can press on the wing with the wind pressure, the more thrust you can generate to go forwards. The sweet spot would be if you could fly the wheel 50 millimetres off the ground um, without the tyre touching at all. But, but the, the craft itself is quite stable, like pop it a, a metre off the ground and, and easily bring it back down. So Glenn's sitting in his seat, pumping on the flap to generate as much power as he can really feathering the, the balance point of that tyre so that he knows he's right on maximum thrust of the craft. Just keeping it basically on the red line. Like he would on America's Cup boat, he'll be very dialed in on the numbers and the settings. The more practice and testing we can do over there, the more we'll sort of tune in on the target numbers as well. Last week saw the start of the long-running Cows Week regatta. We start with day one in the Cape 31 class. Good morning and welcome to Cows on the Isle of Wight for the start of what is the 196th Cows Week Regatta, presented by Visit Abu Dhabi. And uh, what a wonderful day it's looking like out there on the Solent. Uh, pretty flat water, quite a strong tide, and as you can see, a lovely view of the Royal Yacht Squadron, which is where we are on the platform. Well, it all runs because of this man here, Lawrence Mead, the regatta director. Lawrence, um, welcome to 196 regatta. Thank you very much, Steve, and welcome to you and uh, all the competitors. And actually, I'll just go straight in to say it's not really me that does anything. I, I spend a year worrying about it, but there's about 250 volunteers around the place who actually make it happen. So huge thanks to them as well. Well, this is the Musto moment and uh, the show where we're looking ahead to what's happening today. And uh, one of those very important things is, before we actually talk about the organisation, is the weather. <laughs> it all rests on your shoulders, Fiona. Campbell, um, slightly different this year, uh, but uh, they all do rely on wind and that's in your department. They do and it's looking like a great day today actually. We've got a very weak low pressure system far off the northwest coast of Scotland, which won't bring as much in the way of weather, in fact just plenty of sunshine, but what it will bring us is a steadily increasing west going southwesterly gradient. We've already seen the w wind fill in pretty well over the last couple of hours, it was pretty calm at daylight, now we've got up to 8 touching 12 knots at times, so that's great news for racing. And we're going to see that increase continue over the next few hours at least. Um, and again, this afternoon, we've got more of a gradient increase, we're looking at a little bit of thermal enhancement because it's so warm. And so we should see up to a good 15, 16 knots by around three o'clock. One of the success stories here in the UK on the south coast has been with a class that started a long way from here, Cape Town in South Africa. And that class, the Cape 31s. We saw a fleet of seven of them at Cows Week last year and they had some great racing. This year, the fleet is considerably bigger. So I've come along to find out what makes this class tick and why it's been so appealing. So who better a person to talk us through the Cape 31 than the class captain, Dave Sweet. 
Dave, good to see you. Thanks for bringing us down here to have a look at the boat. I think the first thing I want to ask you is, what's behind the success of the Cape 31? Lots of people have had a go at making a 30-foot boat work, and they haven't really succeeded, but this one has just taken off. Uh, the brief was no holds barred boat that sends it, basically, and uh, we took the boat um, from Cape Town, bought it up here, went sailing and we started winning on IRC in the UK. So it kind of went from there. You know, once the boat started winning on IRC, head started turning. Um, you know, timing was right for a 31 foot boat really to, to take off up here and you know, it's been going really well on the Solon. It's exceeded all expectations for us. I think we've sold 35 boats now. Uh, we've got 19 at Cow's Week. Yeah. And it's a high performance boat, but from what I'm hearing, it's actually quite a relatively straightforward boat to handle. We'll get into the detail in a minute, but it's a relatively easy boat to handle. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had people come over from J109s and, and King 40 type um, heavier boats that have always traditionally done well um, out here on the Solon. And yeah, I mean, they're finding it's a whole lot less load on these boats and, and they're actually quite quite grippy downwind and um, you know you don't have to be a super strong you know prop forward to, to get one of these around the track so yeah the loads are a lot less um, they're more forgiving than what people think and um, yeah a heap of fun to sell so the first thing that strikes me about the boat is I know she's sitting at rest but quite a simple quite a straightforward boat it's not cluttered with control lines all over the place is it yeah it's decluttered. A lot of that comes down to the fact we've got um, sheet reelers down below that just sort of transform the boat. That was the first thing we did. Sheet we, reelers, what, taking up the slack of the Yeah, table. so you don't have a, a rope bag and you're not coiling um, spinnaker sheets or halyards. You just pull a, a string and the, the sheets get sucked away. And, you know, that's sort of from the TP52 world. Uh, and that's trickled down into this boat. There's a simple drop line system on here. One person... Um, on the end of a string line, uh, pretty simple. It comes out here at the back of the boat. Uh, you pull the string line and the chute comes down. Pretty similar fashion to a 52 or a 72. We're dropping these sails two boat lengths out from the bottom mark, you know, and it's, you don't even think about a drop anymore. You don't even talk about it. You just come into the bottom mark doing 20 knots and you pull a rope and let a halyard down and, and she comes down. How many crew do you sail with? Yeah, so there's a, a 595 uh, kilo weight limit. Uh, we tend to end up sailing with seven people, you know, if you've got anyone my size on board, uh, you've kind of stuck with seven people, smaller crews get to eight. I mean, of course, moving forward, we can't help but talk about the Mark Mills, you know, patent ramp decks, which we see on all the cut boats now. Um, so, you know, this is a nice, clean deck. I think that the biggest advantage of this was actually aero. Um, and that's why we're seeing it on all the cut boats now, but uh, it's uh, a nice Mark Mills feature and he'd argue he was the first to do it. I think the biggest um, surprise to most people is how well it goes upwind and then obviously downwind speaks for itself. You know, it's, it, it's a bow up, sandy boat and uh, you don't see too many people wiping out really, which is incredible considering how big the, the prod is. Down below, it is small as you'd expect but it, again it's pretty simple isn't it it's pretty straightforward i was expecting to find a much more cluttered boat down below yeah yeah no nice and clean um just uh i guess that the main clutter really is the reelers it's got a pretty decent engine i mean you've got a motor back and in south africa they have to motor back into 35 knots at the end of the day so um a really nice engine there um just looking forward pretty simple bow trampoline which you put the spinnaker on top of and um, there's actually the ability to put a, a toilet down here for um, you know, those who need to use a toilet down below. Um, so yeah enough room to, to shelter really and um, you know get out of the wind that I wouldn't be rushing into my first offshore on this boat but I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen sooner rather than later someone's going to take one of these offshore. Puerto Portal's 52 Super Series Sailing Week, the third regatta of the five-event monohull circuit, ended with South African Phoenix winning by 11 points ahead of SLED and 17 ahead of Preveza. This is the highlights video.
for the third regatta of the season, the 52 Super Series returns to the Mediterranean and to beautiful Puerto Portal. Portals is upscale, it's glamorous and it's chic. This week the Palma Sea Breezes were light. We had eight great races, very difficult, very challenging, one-sided, and a big finale on the final day, the Northeasterly Breeze. Three, two, one. About a minute to burn for the line. After coming painfully close over the past four years, this time it's a win for Tom Slingsby and the Phoenix team. What a great week on and off the water here in the home of happiness where it really is the big, big smiles that tell the whole story. This is an exciting time in Lorient as new boats are being launched. This time it's British super sailor Sam Davies and the Her New Initiative's coureur, Imoka 60 yacht, which she will sail around the world solo, in the next Bondi Globe. Day two at Cow's Week and warm weather, combined with winds gusting above 25 knots, provided lashings of excitement, thrills, spills and adrenaline for competitors across all fleets. Well hello and welcome to another Today in Cow's, it's day two, Sunday, and the Raw Thames we're running things here at the Yacht Squadron, and on the platform were many race officers. Out on the water though was Matt Sheehan. Matt, um, Windy old day and tide was a big thing today, wasn't it? Absolutely, yes. The breeze was up. The forecast was always for that breeze to be more. It was, it was forecast to be over 20 knots, and it was certainly all of that at times. But I think the thing that really spiced things up, as you say, was the tide, because the tide was due to actually turn and push against the breeze, which was going to build the sea state. And in fact, it had quite a big effect on, for some classes, on the racing for the day. It certainly did, and quite a few of the white group were bumped onto committee boat starts to avoid that uh, tidal problem. Yeah, they certainly did. And before we got to that stage, actually during the, the early starts of the day, it was very interesting, I thought, to watch a similar kind of scenario, but different, to yesterday. But I say similar because tide was the absolute key. You had to get your tidal decisions right today on the squadron line heading west and it was tricky because the tide once again was running to the west if you got close inshore and it was running to the east if you went further offshore at the other end of the line. The difficulty was there was less breeze in on the line if you came in to take the good tide and there was more breeze out on the line if you had the tide against you so again there was this difficult choice to be had and yesterday 
it seemed fairly straightforward for a lot of the classes that you had to come in close to the shore and get into that tide. Today, it wasn't like that at all. There were some runaway successes with people who started in the middle of the line or, or just down from the middle of the line and managed to lock into an extra bit of breeze and a lift and just shot off ahead of the rest of the fleet. So it was another trickier day. And of course, it pay, played such an important part in how their races played out later on. Because if you could get a jump on the rest of the fleet, and then turn around the top mark and go down with the tide, you just launched off the horizon. So we saw quite a few classes today where the leaders really were quite a long way ahead of the rest of the fleet. Yes, the courses came into that because uh, uh, the first few classes were going to a windward mark close to the, uh, to the island shore, but then they sprung to a, a mark which is in the middle of the Solent, and uh, there was a real split in the tactician's decision whether to short tack up the coast or head straight out into the strong tide, but obviously the better wind. Mm, yeah, no, it was it was a tricky one, tricky one to do. The other thing that was tricky was um, was for the race committee what to do with the smaller classes because as that tide was building more and more in the later bit of the morning, it was getting stronger and stronger and pushing into a breeze that was also increasing. And the sea state was forecast to be really quite unpleasant for, certainly for the smaller boats, the day boats that have got lower freeboard and, and the rest of it. So the race committee, I think quite wisely made the decision to make a big change and actually send some of those classes further down to the east and have them start over there. Interestingly, not that I wasn't trusting their judgment at all, not for one minute, but on our way out to go and film those, I went and took a look at what conditions would have been like for those boats. So when everybody got up today, one of the things they would have noticed, at least the competitors would have noticed, was that there was an amendment to the sailing instructions. And that was to move some of the classes that were due to start here on the Royal Yacht Squadron line later in the morning to a start line further east. And the reason? the tide and the breeze. The breeze was a fair bit more than yesterday, 20, 25 knots, certainly with gusts forecast to be up in the 25, 27 knot range. That in itself was not such a big problem, but what, was the, what the problem was, was that the tide was building, going towards the west throughout the morning, and that was gonna make for quite a lumpy sea state for the one design boats and boats with low freeboard and the rest of it. It would have made it really quite a slog, an unpleasant slog upwind. We're out here now at, uh, well, let's just see. Yeah, it's about uh, midday, and this is what they would have faced. So a smart decision on the part of the race committee, and that's why the small boats ended up in the eastern Solom. It's day nine at the 2022 RS Games and the inaugural RS Aero Youth Worlds concluded. The RS 700s and RS 800s had to switch modes hard from the day before. With a light shifty breeze across the course, it was a challenging mental day on the water. Welcome to day nine of the RS Games. Today is the last day of the Aero Youth World. We also have day two of the RS 700s and 800s, and we also have the Varios and RS 400s joining us for their first day of racing. We're just waiting to see what's gonna happen with the wind. It's shifting round a lot. Hopefully we should be getting out there soon. First race was general recall. Start attempt number two, clean start for the RS7s. Lithuania having already secured the championship, starting in the middle of the fleet. The big split across the fleet from right to left. A poor start in the final race for Jonathan Bailey, but he's caught up with a lead pack going down the first run. Three nine two nine Jonathan Bailey in second or third place, approaching the last lured mark, which will give him enough to make up his four point deficit. Coming in to take the final race is Varne from Sweden. Coming in in second place, finishing off a great comeback. Jonathan Bailey, our 2022 RS Aero Youth World Champion. Right, 
there's such a strong fleet, um, so to be able to win it is really good. Won the Nationals, coming from that, it was the next event that I wanted to do well at. I wasn't expecting it coming into the week. I was, I was hoping to do well, be near the front and coming out with the win from the girls and also racing really closely with all the boys has been really, I'm quite proud of myself for that. It feels great. I had a pretty rough first day, but I've climbed my way through and finished on top. And to be inspired by the older people as well and to be back at the RS Games, which I did four years ago in the RS Fever. Cows Week, Bruce Grant was on the J70 Endeavour, and he had three races on day two in the 12 race series, and he describes his starting tactics. We're on Endeavour 738, it's one of a squadron charter boats, and uh, this is our second year of having a go. Give us a, just give us an overview of what today was like, because it, it was more than one race for you for a start, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. What the uh, J70s have organised is a four a uh, day series of three races each day and that is really really good um, 12 race series and generally you get the pros or, or the people who are regulars doing really well and the charter fleet will also have a go at the pros so it's just great racing three races today a passage race over to the hillhead plateau which was tough spinnaker reach that was really good and then the uh, second race was two sausages and the third race essentially a passage race back. Now that first passage race as you describe it, we watched the start of that and that looked pretty, it was full on for a lot of classes actually with that tide sweeping over the line. How did it pan out for you? Well, we'd elected to start a little bit further out, which gives you the benefit of anybody who's over the line inshore is gonna block you out. So there were, I understand 12 boats who were over the line. So having crossed the finish line 15th, we've popped up to third, but that is yacht racing and suddenly starting hidden is a very useful technique to use. Uh, so just by starting further out, a little bit more blinded from the uh, race officials, that, that can work. If you're not seen, you didn't do it. So that's, that's yacht racing. Who, who do you think won that race? Oh, I've not had a chance to look myself. <laughs> that's all hearsay. <laughs> no, no problem at all. <laughs> and so in the second two races that you did, how'd you get on there? Uh, we had something like a, a 12th and a 17th. So for us, as I say, a charter boat, um, coming above 20th, I think is quite a good result. This is a hot fleet, 32 boats in the fleet, um, and a lot of really good sailors who've been doing it a lot of time. Mm. So, you know, if you're getting in the mid-teens, that's a pretty good result for us, certainly. So, I know we'll be about 10th or 12th overnight, I would hope. Nice. And it's a, it is, as you say, it's, a, it's an intense fleet. It's been, it's been a very, very popular fleet right from the start, hasn't it? Uh, how are you finding it? Is it the, because it's not necessarily the fastest boat in the world. And as a 14 sailor, former 14 sailor yourself, you know all about speed. But how are you finding it? Is it the intensity of the racing that grabs you or, or what is it? It's the one design. It's the fact that even the charter boats are put together really well. They're no, you know, they're kept really well. And as opposed to owning the boat, I just turn up and I go sailing and the sails are on board, it's beautifully prepared. It's a good deal, it's a really good deal. It's really Australian won two at the Mark IV European Championship of Australian 18-footers, Lazarus Capital Partners and the Rag and Famish Hotel in the first two overall positions. The best Europeans were the Germans on Black Knight, down to third place overall, but still first continental. The other German team on Peroni was second European and fifth overall.
six intense first months for Team Actual as they approach the Route du Rhum. The Actual Group and Yves Leblevec, it's a story that has lasted 20 years since he won fifth place in the Mini Transat in 2001. The Evia Island Regatta 2022 concluded with a coastal sailing race in the waters of the South Evian Gulf. On Saturday evening, the closing ceremony and awarding of the race took place at the facilities of the Chalkida Sailing Club. Προσπαθώντα κάθε χρόνο για την ανάπτυξη του τουριστικού προϊόντος που λέγεται Εύβοια, είναι η πρώτη φορά στα τέσσερα χρόνια που γίνεται η τελετή λήξης στη Χαλκίδα, στην πρωτεύουσα του νομού μας.